Okay, so we're going to talk about representations today, and um, I'm going to get to the representations of the rotation group, and then we're going to do a demo and show you that the representation of rotation group. That the Lee average reflects faithfully the way actual rotations behave. Okay, so what what I want to say is that we've got a group. And um, the I and we're going to parameterize the group with some parameters alpha and um, usually alpha has two, three, four, five. There are two, three, four, five alphas typically. And the idea is that if in the group you have g of alpha prime times g of alpha is some g of, let us say, alpha double prime, then, see, the, the group is abstract. So what we're, the sort of things that we can manipulate are matrices. And we imagine that if, what we arrange is to have finite dimensional matrices so that the product of the matrices um, imitates the multiplication law of the group. Can you see your... Okay. And, in, and in general, we have many uh, representations for a given group because some of them are equivalent, and so we kind of ignore, the, uh, we don't emphasize the difference between different equivalent representations, but there are many, typically many, inequivalent representations. And uh, so if this is a, if this is one representation and this is another, then what we insist on and expect is that every representation is faithful to the multiplication law. That's the whole idea because that's what a representation is. Okay. Now, um, Group theory in general um, can be uh, complicated, but if we look at the, well, first of all, we have a convention here. Not only do we have a parameterization in terms of alpha, but our convention is that g of zero is the identity. Um, and so what we expect then is that D1, that any representation, D of, let us say, epsilon, which is to say all the parameters alpha are very, very small. Epsilon is physics speak for small. And um, so this would be then the identity element of that, the identity matrix of that representation plus a sum epsilon a times some sort of matrices ta. And in fact, conventionally, what we do is we throw in an i. And remember, I told you in physics departments, we're always throwing in i's and h bars in ways that um, don't really make any mathematical sense, but we do it anyway. Is that a question? Um, is the I necessary here for any reason? Is the I there for any reason? Yes. The reason for the I is that we really like to have matrices that are unitary. Um, because unitary transformations are nice, they preserve inner products. And, um, uh, right. And so we want operators. Uh, all the re all the the symmetries of physics are represented by unitary transformations, and um, 
And the reason for that is that we want the commutation relations of the important variables to remain the same. And that happens if you have a unitary transformation. So, um, what we expect then is that the matrices of any representation near the, for small parameters are near the identity matrix and we can write them this way. Now, to get back to your question, which somehow I forgot to answer, um, we want, well, um, groups are either compact or non-compact. If the group is compact, then it will have finite dimensional unitary representations. So if the D is finite, and we're talking here about finite dimensional representation, if the D is unitary, then it's of the form 1 plus i, a real epsilon of emission T alpha. And so we want the T's to be emission. Because, in other words, D, we, D adjoint of epsilon will then be i minus the sum of i epsilon a T a adjoint. And we want that to be T inverse, the T inverse is 1 minus the sum i epsilon a t a. So if we want the inverse to be the adjoint, then the, the matrices have to be Hermitian. And they will be if we have the i in here. If we don't have the i in there, then when we take the adjoint, we don't get this minus sign. And we have to say, it, what we have to say is that uh, the t's are not uh, Hermitian, but anti-Hermitian. That makes more sense. Just to follow up on um, our index that we're summing over the A, what's the significance there? How do we know? Oh, what well, as I over? said, um, the, uh, the beast, if we're going to write the uh, generator, uh, I'm sorry, if we're going to write the matrix near the identity, then for each parameter, remember I said for several alphas, for each alpha there's a matrix here. And these T's are, def are called the generators. And basically, TA for any particular representation is minus I, the partial derivative of the representation with respect to alpha A. And it's evaluated at the identity, all alpha equal to zero. And the minus i is to cancel the i that we put in because uh, it's a physics department and we screw around with these i's. All the time. We, things might be better if we didn't do that, but we do it then. Anyway. Okay, so. So, so what we'll have then is we'll have a set of matrices, and if we're talking for a moment about compact groups, these will be permission matrices, and uh, these things are called the generators of the group of that representation of the group. And um, so, in particular, if this were D one, this would be T F, T sub A one. If this would representation two, this would be T sub A, comma two, and so forth. All right, now let's, let me just sort of see one. Okay. Now, if this is the rep, what the represent, the matrices of the representation look like in the limit of small epsilon. This is, when I say, when I write it this way, what I mean is this is true for arbitrary, I'm, I'm sort of taking the limit without saying so. So this is true for arbitrarily small epsilon. So for actual, if we swell the epsilons up to size alpha, then the way to do that is to exponentiate this. And so what we're going to do is take 1 plus sum A 
I, epsilon, A, T, A, um, and we're going to replace epsilon by alpha A over capital N, and we're going to raise that to the power capital N. So this is how we're going to go from epsilon. The limit N goes to infinity, this is our epsilon. And this, of course, is E to the I sum alpha A T A. And that's what we call D of alpha for this particular representation, similarly for any other representation. Okay, now, um, the marvelous thing about dealing with the matrices near uh, the identity, and therefore where alpha becomes infinitesimally small, and we call it epsilon, is that epsilon squared is zero, um, or at least it's zero compared to epsilon. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do the following. We're going to consider these matrices uh, D of alpha in the limit of um, alpha going to zero. And we're going to consider them, um, well, let's just consider one of them for the moment. And so what we're, and in fact, what I want to do is I want to, let's see, what is that? Okay. So I want to consider these matrices. D of epsilon comma A. And this is going to be E to the I epsilon TA. In other words, I'm just going to have one generator there. And I'm going to leave the epsilon in the um, exponential for the moment. And so I, what I want to do is I want to take the product. Let me get the order of these right. Yeah, for some reason I then switched. All right, let's, that will be, uh, um, that, so let me, let me consider this product, C of minus epsilon A, C of minus epsilon B, C of epsilon A, C of epsilon B. So this is a product of four matrices, each of the same representation near, uh, of course, near the origin. And so this is going to be e to the i epsilon tb, e to the i epsilon ta, e to the minus i epsilon tb, e to the minus i epsilon ta. So that's uh, our little product there. And now we're going to expand them. And this time, we're going to be extra careful um, because um, if we just kept the, if we only kept linear terms, we just get one, and all the linear terms would cancel. So we're going to keep quadratic terms. So we're going to write this then as 1 plus i epsilon tb minus epsilon squared over 2 tb squared. 1 plus i epsilon ta minus epsilon squared over 2 ta squared. 1 minus i epsilon tb plus, no, I screwed up again. This is a minus. Uh, right, all of them are minus because, okay, so I have minus uh, uh, epsilon squared tb squared over 2, 1 minus i epsilon ta minus epsilon squared ta squared, 2 
All right, so we've got the product of these small matrices. Now, if we keep track of what this is, leading terms the identity matrix. And I'll often write the identity matrix just as the number one. Did I question somebody? Um, and now, as I said, the linear term cancels because, for example, we get I epsilon TB times this one, and we also get it times this one and that one. So we get three factors. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not quite right. If we take all the ones except one, we'll get. But if we just take, if, if in the product we have all ones except for one T, linear term T, then we'll get plus I epsilon TB. But over here, we'll get minus i epsilon Tb. And then with this one, we'll get plus i epsilon Ta. And for this one, we'll get minus i epsilon Ta. Is this thing blocking? The, this thing is going to block. But it is later going to block the board, isn't it? So let me sort of put it maybe there. Um, so now let's, let's, let's consider. Almost everything cancels, and what remains is quite nice. Um, let me verify that the TB squared terms cancel. So TB squared occurs here with a minus sign. It occurs there with a minus sign. Now, why is it canceling? I'm oh. You see, TB can also come in with a plus sign like this. So it comes in with a plus sign without any one-halves, and then it comes in with a minus one-half twice. So the TB, TB squared term goes away, the TA squared term goes away. And all that we're left with, it turns out, is epsilon squared times TATB minus TBTA, which is 1 plus epsilon squared the commutator of TA with TB. Okay? And um, if you don't trust me, I encourage you at home to multiply everything out and just cancel with a pencil. Um, okay, now, look for this. this is a very, very important um, formula, and it has two sets of consequences, both of which are very important. Okay, what's the first set of consequences? Well, the first set of consequences is that this, you see, is representing a certain product. And what is the product that it's, be, it's representing? It's g of minus epsilon a, g of minus epsilon b, g of epsilon a, g of epsilon b. So this abstract product of group elements is represented by this product of finite dimensional matrices. And Whatever it is, it's some G of some um, parameter, some G of some, let us just call it alpha, it's some group element. And consequently, that must be some other group element. Let us, I'll just write it as D of alpha. But what is alpha? Well, we've computed what the product is. It's got to be of order epsilon squared. And all of the d's, the most general d, is just the sum of um, i alpha a t a. So this has got to be some sum, and in fact with an i, of alpha A T A, say. Well, 
I shouldn't have used A. Let's let's say alpha C T C. Okay. And what have we learned from that? Well, these alphas, of course, have to depend upon A and B. And in fact, let's not call them alpha, let's call them F. We're going to call them F in a moment, so let's just call them F now. In fact, I should have called them F over here. Anyway, I'll call her another one. Well, I don't know. This, I, I shouldn't change notation. That, but. Anyway, let's say that there are some numbers depending on A and B. Uh, an index C, because we're going to be summing over all of the T's, all of the generators. And um, apparently, it's going to be of order epsilon squared. And so what do we learn from this? What we learn from this is that the commutator of any generator of any representation with any other generator of the same representation is a sum over C of I, F, C, A, B, T, C. It's a sum of generators. And um, our convention here is to write these things as the generators of i and some real number um, uh, alpha. If there's any, if 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 there's any, if there were any phase in alpha, we'd shove it over into the generator because we were thinking we're thinking of the parameters alpha as real parameters. Okay. These things, these f's are called the structure constants. Of the group. Now here's, so, so, so the first thing we learned that's really important is that if we represent group elements in this exponential parametrization. These T's, the generators, have commutation relations that are closed. So this is a sort of closure. Namely, TA, the commutator TATB is a linear combination of the TC's and um, uh, we have an I and uh, real T, real F's, because our convention is that uh, the, the, oh, I left out a one. This is a one here. One plus I X one. So for F small, this is one plus some linear combination of the generators times I times real numbers. Okay. All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is that we did this for a particular representation. And if we now imagine that we did it for representation one, and then we got d1 of that. And so this is the rule for the generators of representation t1. So we might put ones up here. I don't know where to put them. Um, I'll put them here. One, 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 one. But if we did it for representation two, we would get, um, we would have to get a very similar formula because you see the parameters, the representation has to respect the group, the abstract group uh, formula. And um, in fact, the, the way to describe it is that if the original parameters were epsilon, 
then these parameters are epsilon squared f. So maybe I should have written it this way. And so we would have, if we replace the 1 by 2, we'd have another relation here, which would be TA2 commutative TB2 would be a sum over C I F C A D. I'm writing a 2 initially. But now remember that the Fs are the parameters that label the group element. And so we don't want a subscript here. We want to erase that subscript. And the reason is that both representations, D1 and D2, are representations of the same group. So if you have an epsilon here and an index A, B, A, B, then whatever group element is, it's unique. It's epsilon squared times some F. Um, and, or it's a bunch of Fs, actually, because we're summing over C. But it's the same epsilon squared f's. And the result is that the structure constants are the same in all reps of a given group. So in other words, the structure constants are properties of the group, not properties of the representation. And in some sense, what we've just done today in group theory is most of what's important about the algebras. That's the, ba that's the basic important idea, namely that if you look at groups near the identity, you use an exponential parameterization. You lose a little bit of calculus, which in the physics department is just ignoring squares of small numbers. Um, you then uh, find that all the representations of the same group have to have the same structure. Or other, any questions I may have sort of skipped over something too quickly. sizes. One is n by n, the other one is m by m, or q by q, or something. And these commutation relations then are quite different. This is maybe 2 by 2, this is 3 by 3 in matrix size. But the structure constants have to be the same. Okay, So that's, that's a remarkable property. Um, Okay, now let's focus on a particular representation. 
Um, these TAs then are n by n matrices, and um, you can take linear combinations of them. In fact, you can first of all define an inner product of T. You can say TA, TB is the trace of TA dagger TB. This is uh, an inner product. Inner products, um, you're familiar in physics classes with the dot product of real three vectors. That's an inner product. Um, but often in, in physics, we have complex numbers and complex vectors. And if you take, the, take one vector, take the complex conjugate of that vector, and dot it into the other vector, that's also an inner product. Okay. And that basically is the model of all inner products. It's you complex conjugate one and then dot them together. Um, and this is a way of doing this. The, the, the complex conjugate dots them. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the adjoint um, takes a complex conjugate. And then there's also a transpose. And um, if you look at that sum, then it would be um, this T A, let me raise the A's and the B's. It, this would be T A complex conjugate, and instead of I J, it would be J I, and this would be um, J I, and this would be a sum on I J from 1 to n if they're n by n. And so you see it is very much a dot product because you sum over all the i's and j's, you star one of them, and then you just dot them together. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very handy, but, um, yeah, I wasn't meant to have that handy, but where's the h bar coming from? h bar? Oh, That's brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. That's the same reaction I had when I was a graduate student. I missed a class in Schwinger, which who hadn't talked about H bars introduced the trace. This is a trace. This is a TR. I, I, see. I was puzzled for quite a while in that class. And he wasn't giving out candy if he asked questions, so I didn't ask any questions. I just sat there puzzled for about five minutes, and then I realized he was taking the trace. Okay, so that's an inner product. Now, once you have an inner product, of course, you can make these t's uh, orthogonal. In fact, you need to make them orthonormal, but you don't want to make them orthonormal. And the reason you don't want to make them orthonormal is you've got to keep the, com the, the structure constants the same for all representations. And if you, um, you can make these guys orthogonal, so you, uh, but uh, you don't want to make them uh, orthonormal. And so what you have as a relation, maybe we can go around to the sideboard now. What you have is you, um, you say that the inner product of two of these, which is, I'll use capitals then, TA dagger TB is a constant K times delta AB. And this K is, uh, depends on the representation. So for a given D, you have a given K. OK, now, now that we made them orthogonal, we can um, do the following. We can take the trace of the commutator of TATB with, I chose to use TD dagger for some reason. Okay, so what's that? Well, that will be I 
F A B C T C T D dagger and trace. And we're summing here over over what? Over uh, we have A and B and D fixed, so we're summing over C. Over all the generators of the uh, group. Notice that the, the, the index A refers to the parameters uh, alpha. How many real numbers are in the parameter alpha? So that's a characteristic of the group. And of course it would have to be because it's something that is an index of the structure constants. Okay, but now we've said that this thing is K delta CD. And so this is I F C A B K delta C D and um, yes. Uh, what is the delta? What does it represent? Oh, it represents zero or one. Okay. Kronecker delta. So let's let's um, delta. What do I have there? C D. One if C equals D, zero if C not equals C. But you switch kinds. Okay. So that's uh, what happens, and in fact, we can now unravel this formula because um, I guess we still have this sum over C, and what we finally get here is I F D. A, B, K. And um, so now we have a formula, namely F, D, A, B is equal to, we can cancel the I's. Wait, can we cancel the I's? I didn't cancel the I's here. Ah, yeah, there's no Y over here. So um, it's minus I over K trace of T A T B T D data. And of course, we'll normally replace D by C since we like the beginning and the end. These videos are available on the web pages, so. Um, okay, so that's a formula for the um, structure constants. So, uh, and of course, as I said to you, the structure constants are the same for every representation of a given group. So if you want to compute them, you just find the representation that ha that's the smallest. You know, if you can find one that's two by two or three by three, uh, you use that representation and just compute, uh, just compute all these, and um, uh, you then have the uh, um, structure constants for that group. Now, obviously, well, maybe I shouldn't say obviously, but let's just point out that T A T B is minus T B. TA because the commutators, this is TATB minus TBTA, and this is TBTA minus TATB, and so you need a minus sign, and you get exactly the same thing. So consequently, since we've got this minus sign built in here, this is minus FG TA. So the structure constants are anti-symmetric on um, the lower indices. Um, okay, so now 
things get simpler if we just have um, compact groups. But uh, I think you can leave it there. Um, uh, so let me um, actually let me ask you people a question. Does anybody know where to buy good chalk? Korea. <laughs> Korea? Mm -hmm. or, or France. 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 Or France. If you try but, but not a store. Uh, not America. Not America. Yeah. Or, <clears throat> yeah. You used to be able to get good chalk in America, but I don't know where to get it now. There's a teacher's supply store on huh? the... There's a teacher's <laughs> supply store. I don't need that information. And I... There's a what? It's like a, it's called like Teacher Heaven or something like that. Um, I think it's on Manal. Oh, the, the, the place where the high school teachers go to buy stuff? Yes. No, I, yeah, they no longer have big chalk. Hmm. Um, oh, you can ask Kevin Burns in the math department. Kevin Burns in the math department? He, has some, he knows where to buy a bunch. He knows He's the good stuff. He's told us. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. We used to buy it from a certain company, um, and uh, apparently that company stopped making it. I don't know if they went out of business or they just, I guess if they're making chalk and no longer sell chalk, they're out of business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's why there's an issue. Um, it may be that a lot of places are switching to whiteboards, which have certain advantages. And, uh, all right, I don't know. Anyway, so let's now um, think in terms of compact and non-compact groups. First of all, if okay, maybe swing around. If we have any T, TA, we can write it as TA plus TA dagger plus TA minus TA dagger, say over 2. And um, this is Hermitian, this is anti Hermitian. So, if we've got then a, a D of alpha, which we're writing as E to the I, say a sum over A, alpha A, T A, we can say, well, that is really a sum A over A, um, alpha A, uh, T uh, remission sub A plus T anti remission sub A. I'm calling this T remission and the other one T anti remission sub A. And so we can say that our um, That that's the way our general uh, group elements will, uh, that's the way they'll look. And um, now, if the adjoint is the inverse, which is to say, if the group is compact, then um, then there aren't any T anti hermitian ones, then all of the T's, then TA dagger is TA, and these, these terms are just identically zero. And in fact, we can, um, there's a standard formula for the norm of a matrix. There are many standard formulas, but the one I'm going to use is trace of uh, D of alpha dagger <coughs> D of alpha 
which we saw was that same inner product that I was using. I was using it for, for the generators here. I'm using it for whole matrices. And um, this would have things anti-emission real and an I means that um, you have something that is uh, it's E to the real. And as you let these, if the group is non-compact, then these alpha parameters can get very big. And if, if they multiply a Hermitian matrix, then we have an I here. The thing is unitary and nothing gets very big. But if this is anti-Hermitian and you let the alphas get big, then this thing can go to infinity. So the deal, so, so that's the case for non-compact groups. So basically you have, um, for non-compact groups, you're going to have some non-Hermitian generators. Um, but for compact groups, they're all going to be Hermitian. Now, um, so let's, let's uh, specialize the compact case for a second. Um, then, uh, TA is all, the, all of them are permissions. And consequently, the structure constant formula is minus I over K, trace, commutated TA, TB, with uh, TC, Daga, well, this thing is the same thing as minus i over k trace t a t b t c for the compact case, and um, now what you can do is you can take advantage of the fact that the trace of a B is the same thing as the trace of oh God, I wrote it backwards. Trace of B A and consequently trace of A B C is the same thing as trace C A B and and this is the same as the trace of um, B, C, A, and so forth. So what we say is that the trace is cyclic. And consequently, we can write this thing. We can say F. So here we have a formula for FABC, like this for compact groups. The formula for FBAC is minus I over K trace TATC TB. And so this is minus I over K trace um, T A T C T B minus T C T A T B. Whenever I said T B in the last few um, last fifteen minutes or so, I thought of um, a play by Woody Allen in which. Um, uh, there are various Greek characters, ancient Greece, okay, so they're dressed in these white robes. Although I don't know what people in ancient Greece actually wore white robes. But anyway, Woody Allen had them dressed in white robes. And um, uh, as you know, many of the, you know, medicine, uh, Western medicine started in Greece, and so the names of many diseases are Greek, and Greek words, diabetes and um, uh, and so forth. And so Woody Allen named his characters after various diseases. So there was one guy with diabetes. Um, name a disease as a Greek name. 
Huh? Bronchitis. Bronchitis, okay. I, I might agree. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it was really quite amusing. Uh, every time people would introduce themselves as diseases, and of course the names were obviously Greek, and so it, it, it um, anyway, it was very funny. <laughs> Okay, so what do we have? Um, uh, we can now use the cyclic property of this. We run of the trace to write this as minus i over k trace of. Um, I br you can bring the T B forward, so you have T B T A T C minus. And what did I do here? I push the T C to the end. Then it's T A T B T C, and so this is minus I over K trace, and now we have T B T A commutator with T C, and so this is F C B A, and so now we've learned something that F B A C is F C B A, and of course F C B A is also minus F C A B because the things are always anti-symmetric on these two indices. Well, with a similar similar manipulation, you can find that F C A B is F B. C A, which is also minus F B A C. So we've got a whole slew of um, relations there uh, among the structure constants. This is for compact groups. And it turns out that um, because of these relations, what you can say is and in fact, what's often done is instead of writing FCAB, we just write this as FABC. And now these relations that I just derived for compact groups, this again is compact, the great because we're using the hermeticity of the generators. Uh, it turns out that this, these things are then totally anti-symmetric. Totally anti-symmetric on in the three indices A, B, and C. Okay, now in, in fact, the F's, we can show that the F's are actually real. And um, what we'll do is write FABC, which is minus I over K trace of TATB TC. This is again for compact groups. If we take the complex conjugate of that, we get F star ABC, it'll be I over K trace, and when you take the trace of um, the complex conjugate of the trace of a matrix, you uh, switch the order. It's the trace of the adjoint. When you take the adjoint, you have to throw things around. So we get TC, the adjoint of TA with TB, And this was T A. This was T. My goodness, that's a T. That's a C. I don't know why I made it an A. That's T C adjoint, but we're in the compact group, so they're all permission. So now, if you take the adjoint, you have to put things in opposite order. So it's I over K trace T C then it is uh, TBTA, but they're both permission. So it 
looks like that. And so what is that? That's equal to um, minus i over k. Notice you can put the tc over here again because this, the trace is cyclic. And if you change this from ba to ab, you get a minus sign. So this is trace of tatb and then finally tc. Sorry for the rain, the chalk is almost done. And that's fabc. So we've uh, F A B C, but it's also we've been writing it as just F A B C. So what we've seen is that the compact groups, the structure constants are real. So let me um, quickly jump to the rotation group. Um, so the rotation group, what do we have? Well, we know that the rotation group, first of all, is a group O3. O3 is more than the rotation group. Rotation group times really the rotation group times Z2, Z2 being 1 minus 1. Remember that finite group we talked about, 1 minus 1? And so the O3 is, is 3 by 3 matrices of unit determinant, that's SO3, and then minus SO3 is um, the other one and the two together form O3. So then is the O3 including the reflections as well? Yeah, O3 has the reflections, that's the minus one. You're gonna open a candy store. Okay, so what we see is that we have R of X dot R of Y, and this is X transpose, R transpose, R, Y. X and Y are three vectors. And um, this has to be the same thing as X transpose Y, which is X dot Y, since we're talking about real vectors. And uh, so how do we arrange for this to be true? We arrange for this to be true if we have R transpose R is I, then that certainly will be true. And um, the determinant of um, R transpose R is the determinant of R transpose determinant of R. Determinants of transposes are the same as the true as a determinant, and so that's that, and this has to be the identity, and so this is equal to one. So the determinant of an O3 matrix is plus or minus one, that's why we have a disconnected group, two subgroups. And so what one does in group theory is you write this basically as Z2 times SO3, and there's no point in analyzing this in detail any further, you just go immediately to the SO3. So that's why all the groups that you see in physics, or most of the groups you see in physics have an S in front of them, because we throw away the part that's um, the trivial part that's um, just um, plus or minus one, plus one and minus one in the case of O3, or it's a U1 in, in a unitary case. All right, now let's look at, let's, let's do what we did before, but for this, uh, for the rotation group. So here, if we say that R is equal to one plus omega, where omega is small, then this is one plus omega transpose 
1 plus omega is equal to 1, well, or i if you want. And so this just is omega transpose plus omega is equal to 0. So the idea is that omega has to be a 3 by 3, 3 by 3 anti-symmetric matrix. I'll square the M. Okay. And so omega transpose is minus omega. There are three of these matrices. Uh, omega 1, well, there are various ways of doing this. One conventional way is to write them this way. That's omega 1. Omega 2 is 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then omega 3 is 0, 1, 0, uh, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So these are three totally anti-symmetric matrices. That's all totally anti-symmetric real matrices that there are. And um, it turns out that we can rewrite these three matrices in the following way. We can say omega B is a matrix whose AC element is epsilon ABC. Remember, epsilon ABC is 1 if ABC Epsilon 1, 2, 3 is 1, and epsilon is totally anti symmetric. And because it's totally anti symmetric, then it's 0 if any index repeats. And you, uh, once you know that epsilon 1, 2, 3 is 1, you can figure out any of the other non zero ones just by counting how many times you had a permutation there. And, um, but these things are anti-symmetric, so they're not Hermitian. Real and anti-symmetric, so they're not Hermitian. So, of course, in physics departments, what we say is we have the TB's AC is uh, I, epsilon ABC. And then um, we just multiply these matrices together to see what the structure constants are. And if we do that to find T, the T's this way, we find that TA, TB is I sum on C from 1 to 3, epsilon ABC TC. So in other words, the structure constants FABC is epsilon ABC. And if we want to make contact with the more general description earlier, that's FCAB. But this, of course, is a compact group, so you can just write it F sub ABC. OK, well, in, um, in uh, In physics departments, we're not happy with having the omegas uh, real and anti-symmetric. As I said, we multiply by i to make them permission and so forth. And um, in fact, we go maybe one extra step. Maybe I'll change colors. For use you. And what we do, so in other words, the T's, so TA is I omega A. Let me make sure I've got the I in the right place. Yeah. Um, and now what we say is LA is H bar TA. So I H bar omega A, and this is H bar not trace. Um, 
And now what we have then is the commutation relations LA, LB is sum C equals 1 to 3, um, I H bar epsilon ABC LC. So these are the commutation relations of angular momentum. And these are the commutation relations of angular momentum because the L's are the generators of rotations. These are the emission operators and quantum mechanics to generate rotations. Okay, now I can do the demo. Namely, what do we expect uh, from, from rotations? In fact, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to repeat this thing. Okay, I'm going to do a right-handed rotation about the x-axis right-handed rotation about the y-axis, and then I'm going to reverse the first two rotations and see what we get as a result. And what we should get is a smaller rotation about whatever axis it happens to be. Well, if, if this is x and that's y, then this has to be z because the thing is totally anti-symmetric. So we expect a Z rotation. All right, now let's see if I can do it without screwing it up. Um, the first several times I did this demo, I actually rehearsed it. But um, the last few times I've done it, I've just winged it. Well, let's see. I don't. I think maybe I'm going to move it to that end of the table. Somehow. Okay, so. Start with it like this. And, um. So I'm going to imagine that this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis, this is the z-axis, x, y, z, and the first thing then is a right-handed rotation about the x-axis. The x-axis, wait a minute, am I actually doing that? Ah, the x-axis is this way, yeah, I've got to keep straight. So I want to do a right-handed rotation about the x-axis, so that's this. Okay, so okay. now I want to do a right-handed rotation about the y-axis, which is the one going this way, and so it's essentially that. I don't know if I quite got it right. Okay, now I want to reverse them. So I want to do a left-handed rotation about the x-axis. And now I want to do a left-handed rotation about the y-axis. I hope I've kept these straight. So, All right. So what do we have? We indeed have a rotation about the z-axis. It was sticking out this way. Now it's this way. And what is it? It's a left-handed rotation about the z-axis. Okay, let's see if that fits our commutation relations. Um, so, what are we doing? Uh, it turns out that minus uh, t1, a minus sign here in a t1 is a right-handed rotation about the x-axis. So epsilon is positive, and it's 1. This then is 1, 2, 3. So that's positive, but it's a plus sign here. That means it's left-handed. Because remember, minus sign is right-handed. 
So indeed, it turned out to be a um, left-handed rotation about the z-axis. Now, of course, when I did it, you know, this wasn't a perfect demo. In fact, why don't uh, I bet one of you guys would like to try it? Or two of you. All right, come on up. Does anybody else want to help her? No? All right. We've got four minutes or so, so we could have one person after another do it. All right, let me get out of your way. So, first, it's right handed. Right handed about the x axis. Remember, the x axis is that way. Right? Y axis is that way. A little more. All right. <laughs> so do all of the big now. It's okay. Okay. Now it's so now it's right handed about Y. All right, a little more maybe because you did a big one. Okay. Now left handed about X. Good. And now, left-handed about Y. Oh! You're going the wrong way. I think. No. No. Oh no! I broke our theory. Right? I think you're right, actually. Is this what you did? Yeah. You were right. <laughs> cool. Okay, so that's very nice. Once again, you see it's altogether a left-handed rotation about the team. All right, does anybody else want to do it? We've got. I'm afraid I'll break it. You want to try it? No, I'm afraid I'll break it if I touch it. I don't want to break it. All right, you do it. All right, let me set it up for you so that we start out with. Okay, so, so you're going to do right-handed about X. Good. Wow, that's big. Okay, so you have to do the wall big now. Okay. Now, right-handed about Y, and Y is going that way. Two more, maybe. All right. All right, now... You want to do a left-handed rotation about the x-axis, right? Yeah. One more. All right. Now a left-handed rotation about the y-axis. All right. We. Well, it's, it's good. Yeah, yeah. All right, so it used to be here, yeah. now it's there. You want to do it? Anybody else? Okay. Anyway, if, of course, we, if this were computer control, it would be exactly right. And um, one gets exactly this and the limit, of course, of epsilon going to zero not epsilon being uh, 20 degrees. So one degree would give you a very accurate one. But then the amount of the Z rotation would be, you know, too small to see if you did one degree. Mm -hmm. All right, I guess we're done. Did anybody ask a question and not get a candy? Is anybody starving? And here, the guy with the camera gets the second one. Oh, thank you.